Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to present uh, this work on ACNET. Deep learning for 3D data has recently become quite popular. Alone at this CUPR, we had three sessions on 3D vision, and every session included at least one deep learning paper. One popular application is shape classification. We're given a bunch of 3D meshes, and the goal is to assign each 3D mesh a discrete label or category. With popular data sets like ModelNet 10, 40, or the ShapeNet classification challenge. Another application that was presented at this CVPR is semantic sync completion, where the input is a, simul, a single depth map, and the goal is to estimate for each voxel in the scene its occupancy and also its semantic class. And finally, also more traditional computer vision uh, problems are now tackled with deep learning, like 3D reconstruction or uh, depth fusion. But all of these uh, applications face a similar problem, and that is that the memory requirements increase cubically with respect to the input resolution. Imagine a simple classification network as we have sketched here. If you want to train it, um, you can train it up to a resolution of 64 to the power of 3 on a single GPU, but not beyond that. However, 3D data is usually pretty sparse. For example, a lighter point cloud, as depicted here, covers a huge area, but the point density is rather low. Also, if you have given an input mesh, the common approach is to voxelize it, and if you increase the, vox uh, the input resolution of the uh, uniform occupancy grid, you get more and more details, but also the percentage of occupied uh, voxels decreases. So, of course, we are not the first one that exploit this property of 3D data. Lee and colleagues proposed at last NIPS field probing networks, where they placed uh, probing weights into the volume and compute the linear combination of the probing weights with the input values. And then they learn end to end uh, not only the, the probing weights, but also the position. However, these field probing layers cannot be stacked. Another work related to ours is PointNet, presented at this CVPR. We apply a multi-layer perception uh, on each 3D point independently and then pull over the number of points to get a global signature. And with that, you can do classification, part segmentation, or semantic segmentation. Uh, one problem with that work is that it does not take into account the local structure of the points. And finally, we are related to our work are sparse convolutions, where you apply the convolution only on non-empty, like non-zero voxels, and push the values according to the convolution weights to neighboring voxels. Uh, the problem here is that you increase your memory after each convolution. So we made the following observation. We trained a very simple classification network on ModelNet, and then had a look at the activations after each pooling layer. And as you can see here in 3D and in 2D, the activations are mostly near the surface. So the idea is to focus the memory consumption of the network, but also the computational power uh, near the surface, and then share everything else farther away. So in ArcNet, we use a space partitioning function within network architecture. Uh, that is, we use an arc tree, where an arc tree cell can cover multiple voxels uh, that are farther away from the surface and finer uh, octree cells that cover voxels that are near the surface. More specifically, we use a grid of shallow octree. A shallow octree is, is an octree with a fixed depth, um, so it covers a fixed number of, of voxels. And if we place several of these shallow octrees in a grid structure, we can cover the whole volume quite efficiently. So why do we use uh, shallow octrees? Shallow octrees can, can be efficiently encoded as bit strings, where each bit indicates if an octree cell is split or not. Uh, further, these bit representations uh, allow us a fast address resolution, and this is important if you want to implement uh, the network operations on the GPU. 
Regarding network op operations, we have to define them specifically for this irregular data structure. And first and foremost, we define the convolution. For the convolution, we apply the, the weight filter on each voxel location, as you would do on a uniform grid. But this, uh, this results in different responses within a single octree cell. However, we want not waste uh, memory. We want to just use a single feature vector inside these larger octree cells. So we have to summarize these responses. And we do that by pooling. And that's the result of the convolution operation. We note that all these operations are differentiable, and hence we can do end-to-end -end learning on this structure. Another operation that needs to be defined is pooling. And as I've mentioned uh, in the previous slide, the uh, representation on the larger octree cells are already pooled. So it's also only relevant for the smaller octree cells, here indicated by the red color. We pull them in larger octree cells, and then we have to decrease the resolution of the whole octree structure here. And we do that by combining neighboring shallow octrees. So we can repeat this operation. We pull on the finest resolution, and then combine neighboring shallow octrees. In a similar way, we can also implement the arm pooling operation that is needed, for example, in, in semantic segmentation. So what's now the impact of this octree structure? So you might remember this screen graph from a previous slide where we evaluated a network on the classification task. And you cannot fit it on a single GPU beyond the input resolution of 64 to the power of 3. However, if you train this very same network architecture with our ArcNet, you can easily fit the same architecture up to an input resolution of 256 to the power of 3. Another point is runtime. And if we have a look at the runtime, the dense network operating on the voxel grid has a small benefit for smaller resolutions up to 64 to the power of 3 due to the faster memory access patterns. But beyond that, our ArcNet is much faster. Another question we have to ask is if we lose on the representational power of this ArcNet. And for that, we evaluate it on the ModelNet DEN dataset uh, for various input resolutions. And as you can see, using the same uh, network architecture for our ArcNet and the DanceNet, we get nearly the same classification and accuracy. We also have done this uh, evaluation on the ModelNet 40 dataset with quite the same outcome. However, to our surprise, uh, we noticed that the input resolution for this task is not uh, so not really needed. As you can see here for the ModelNet 10 dataset, you are almost done with 60 to the power of 3. And for the ModelNet, data, uh, ModelNet 40 dataset, you are almost done with 32 to the power of 3. So why is that the case? We had a quick look at some of the shapes voxelized on a very coarse resolution. And here, on this coarse resolution, you cannot really distinguish the first two and the second two. But if you only increase the voxelation a little bit, you can already see that this is different from the second one. This is a bath tube, and this is a bat. However, for even higher input resolutions, you cannot really distinguish a nightstand from a, from a dresser. So we had a look at another experiment. And this is orientation estimation, where we took a single category from the ModelNet dataset. In this case, it's the chair. And then added random rotations. And the network had to estimate these uh, rotations for unseen test in instances. And here you can see if we increase the input resolution up to 64 to the power of 3, we get much better accuracy. We can also visualize that qualitatively. As we increase the resolution, these rotations estimates get much better. So the final task we had a look on was a semantic 3D point cloud labeling where the input is a colored 3D point cloud, and we voxelize it to feed it to our network as depicted here. And then the output of the network is a semantic label for each voxel. Then we can back project it to the point cloud and compare it to the ground truth. So we evaluated it on the VAR city dataset, 
And as we fit one facet into higher and higher input resolutions, we get much better accuracy. And the input resolution of 256 to the power of three is needed to get state-of-the-art results on this data set. So I want to conclude with a short outlook that we, ha we and also others have a look on, and that is if you want to generate octrees, so if the space partitioning function is not known a priori, for example, in, in reconstruction or depth completion. And that's exactly what we have done. We had, uh, we had a look at depth completion and, uh, and yeah, depth completion, where we compared ourselves to TSTF Fusion and TVL1 Fusion, and this is our result of our network. So I hope I see many of you at the poster to discuss this paper further, and thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Are there questions? Okay, so I'm, I'm curious, given the, uh, with the Ocnets, um, do you see possibilities to extend that even to temporal, uh, temporally varying, so four-dimensional volumes in medical or in other areas? Would there be any challenges or? Um, with, with this approach, with the bit string, it might be a bit of a challenge because it's already a trade-off using the shallow octrees. So, I'm not quite sure yet. I would have a look at it. Okay. Um, so if there are no further questions, then thank you again. <laughs>